Hello, welcome back. Uh, this is part of the uh, Jordan Con online uh, content. Uh, this is Ryan Sesney. Um, I'm the current director of the gaming track, and I'm here with a uh, guest today. If you'd be so kind to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Brian Lane. By day, I am a physics faculty member at the University of North Florida, and by night, I write supplemental uh, third-party content for Pathfinder Second Edition. Yep, and. Uh, on a personal note, um, you're also local to me, so uh, I've yeah. had the pleasure to meet you a number of times in person, and what is it, uh, although I'm familiar with your, uh, what is it, attendance in uh, Jordan Con in the past, as I'm the one who, uh, what is it, carpooled up. I believe you gave you. me a ride, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, this is a bit more intimate than I usually get with guests, because we were in a <laughs> car for like eight hours together. <laughs> But, 16 uh, if you count both ways oh yeah <laughs> well i think it was longer on the way up because of the uh atlanta traffic getting oh there was the... that horrific traffic and we saw i i hope it turned out to be a prosthetic arm in the road but there was something weird in the road on our way there if i remember yeah like uh we never got uh the other end of that story yeah uh what is it i i hope it was a prop too <laughs> but uh yeah to get a little bit back on track um so you have a book of archetypes that is coming out for the Pathfinder second edition. What is it? Uh, you want to uh, tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So the book I'm titling Fantastic Careers because I wanted to create some player options that would give you the feeling that your character has a job in a way that maybe a class is a bit too generic for. So I've got archetypes for fortune tellers, chefs, teachers, uh, uh, pilgrims on their way to some holy site. So just the, the thing that you are doing with your life besides adventuring that also comes in and dovetails with your adventuring life. For folks who are unfamiliar, an archetype is something that kind of gets bolted onto your class in the game. So uh, by the base rules, archetype feats can replace your class feats. Uh, but there's a very popular variant called the free archetype rule where everybody just gets a separate track for their archetype and it doesn't deplete their their usual feats that they get and that's been a very popular option um and i wanted to give some options for players to use both in and out of combat to kind of give your character that extra dimension of you know you you, you say that your character is an artist well what does that mean that they do so most are tied to the character's background there's another class mechanic called the background that describes what you did before you started adventuring and these archetypes kind of allow you to explore that background more in real time. Um, I should also say that many also include uh, a new game element that I'm calling story feats that your GM can just award you when you reach a certain milestone. So say for example, you take the Holy Pilgrim archetype or you're on your way to a site that is important to your character's faith. Well, something should happen when you get there, right? Because hopefully at some point you get to that site in your adventure. And so when you actually get there and complete whatever kind of right your GM wants you to, your GM can say, oh, there's this free feat here in the book. You now have that. And so it's just a neat way to kind of blend the story and the mechanics a little bit more. I got you. One of the handy things about uh, that particular edition in general is uh, archetype is such a commonly used uh, term uh, in terms of uh, story writing. So I feel that that's a very natural language. I'm, I'm a big fan about uh, the terminology and uh, basically the, the way that that can uh, very organically build onto a character. Um, so let's do a little bit of a, an exercise here using some of your material just to show it off. Uh, obviously, Wheel of Time fan how would we make a player character that uh, basically is Matt from Wheel of Time? I'm sure there are hundreds of variations on this on the internet. I'm sure that's a, a first uh, type of character people try to make. Um, <clears throat> starting with, with the basis, starting with ancestry, I would go halfling. Um, I know Matt is a human, obviously, but he is from the Two Rivers, which is the Wheel of Time equivalent of the Shire story-wise, so maybe it works. The reason we're going halfling, though, is to get a couple of important things at first level. First is we can pick the gutsy halfling heritage, which improves Matt's saves against emotion effects. So we want Matt to have, we want to start building up his luck, right? Uh, and then at first level, we can take the halfling luck 
ancestry feat where we get to reroll a failed check. Um, you, you get to do this reroll on a failure, but you have to take the second result even if you get a critical failure. And nothing to me says Matt more than I'm gonna press my luck in the situation and it might go even worse than it did. Um, that feat's also gonna be important because at higher levels that will open up more luck feats down the line. Um, looking over his background, I was initially gonna go with the gambler background. That seems pretty obvious, but then in the advanced player's guide, I found this rare background called returned. I'll just read the text to you. A little bit of spoilers from Matt here, obviously. You died and miraculously returned with knowledge of the realms beyond death and a stronger link to life. Some dead and undead souls might feel a strange instinctual kinship with you. That to me sounds like Matt. Um, you end up with a feat that makes it harder for you to die. Um, and flavor-wise, you get an additional feat for Boneyard lore, which is the Paizo-specific afterlife. I would probably haggle with my GM to turn that into past life lore. Uh, I, I think that probably is pretty equivalent. For class, I think we're going to go Swashbuckler. Uh, Swashbuckler from the Advanced Player's Guide is defined as being in a state of panache. So you are either in panache or not in panache, and your abilities change depending on which state you're in. And we're going to reflavor this as anytime Matt is in panache, the dice are rolling in his head. And when he ends his panache to do something cool, that's when the dice stop rolling. So we're just reflavoring the mechanic there a little bit. Um, uh, as far as the, the subclass or the path, I think we're going to go wit, which gets Matt trained in diplomacy. The only other option I could think of would be for Matt to be trained in intimidation, but I always think of Matt as more clever than scary. Um, but also that diplomacy is going to be important because uh, at first level, we're going to take the feat one for all, which uh, allows you to work better with your allies. So this is kind of bringing in Matt as the general kind of early on there. Um, and before we get too far into feats, the thing we absolutely have to negotiate with our GM, if we're going to build Matt, we have to play with some sort of crit deck, right? Where if you get a critical success or critical failure, you draw a card and it gives you an extra effect. I think that's the perfect way to represent Matt's life as a Taviran is to just add in those extra effects to get those from the get-go. For second level, we're going to go with a feat called Charmed Life. It gives you a boost to some of your saves or gives you a reaction that you can use with your, uh, with your saving throws. And this is a prerequisite for an 18th level feat called Incredible Luck. So we're just anything that is at all luck flavored or lets us change a saving throw, we're going to go for that because this is, this is Matt's severe in nature. Uh, then at fourth level, if my GM allows me to use some third party content, we're going to use the up and coming Jolly Gambler dedication in Fantastic Careers. Uh, the idea of the Jolly Gambler is that you, you like to gamble, but you're not doing it so that you can swindle other people out of their money or because you have some sort of compulsion to gamble. It's because you just enjoy the game. To you, life is a game. That's going to open up a sixth level Jolly Gambler feat called Hedge Your Bets, where you can... Actually, let me pull the text up for that. I have it open. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> so that's going to open up for uh, at level... Yeah, excuse me, six. That's going to open up at level six. We're going to take the Jolly Gambler feat, Hedge Your Bets, uh, where you spend an action to assess a foe's likely course of action that they're going to take, and you plan your contingencies accordingly. So this is kind of gambler mat, kind of general mat, getting blended together. What happens is you attempt a melee strike against a creature, and the strike gains a failure effect. If you fail, not critically fail, but if you fail, you can then attempt to faint against the target, or steal from the target as a free action. And you can attempt this steal action even though you're not in combat. I had to add that fine print. So basically Matt says, oh, I meant to miss, and now I'm gonna look like I meant to miss, and so I'm gonna faint, or I'm gonna try to pickpocket from the, from the person I'm attacking there. And then the last detail I'll give at eighth level, um, we're gonna go back over to Swashbuckler and take Vivacious Bravado. Uh, this was a really interesting one. We're gonna reflavor this one as well. So the text for Vivacious Bravado, your ego swells, granting you a temporary reprieve from your pain. So the, the requirement is you gained panache this turn, so you've entered, so the dice have started rolling in Matt's head. You gain temporary hit points equal to your level plus your charisma modifier that lasts until the start of your next turn. And we're going re to reflavor this 
as those bloody memories coming up in Matt's head and they're kind of getting him swept along in battle. And just for fun, we're going to impose a penalty that for the rest of that turn, Matt has to talk in the old tongue. Nice. So with just a few flavor tweaks here and there, we can really get the swashbuckler, jolly gambler feeling like Matt. Oh, yeah. The good thing about Pathfinder is there's a lot of detail to it. And yeah, you can make a, a lot of things like that with just like simple reflavorings. That's that's a really good uh, one as far as that goes. Um, yeah, the basic design rule is the first sentence of each feat is something flavorful. Yeah. And so if you want to say, I like the mechanics, but I'm not really doing this. Yeah, you can just change that flavor thing. And as long as you're not like, you know, as long as you're not obviating some rule, like, well, you and the creature have to share a language to do this. You know, you're, yeah. you're, 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 you're fine. No, I, I feel you there. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's go the opposite way. We want, um, we want a villain and we're going to make him like a PC just, you know, to make him a bit more hardy, more interesting, um, because we're going to have him like, uh, you know, come in and out a couple times. Uh, let's do a Trolloc. Uh, maybe more of a general type, let's say. Yeah. So for a Trolloc, if I'm the GM and I'm wanting to bring in a Trolloc, uh, the thing I would start with, I would start with one of the were creatures. Pathfinder is infamous for its wide variety of were creatures, werewolves, were rats, were bears, were they, they had were insects in in one uh, book in, in first edition. Um, so I'd start maybe with the were bear. I think it's a level five creature. Excuse me, it's level four. Yeah, the were bear is level four. It's listed as being lawful good because it's like this forest guardian, but you can reflavor alignment. There's usually not an issue there. So we're gonna start with the were bear. Uh, we're going to make it evil, obviously. I think we're going to have to lower its intelligence and, and wisdom. Uh, right uh, by the the base stats, the wear bear gets an int of modifier of plus one and a wisdom modifier of plus three. That really does not sound too much like a trollic, so we maybe drop those a little bit. Um, we've also obviously got to drop any of its shape changing uh, moon frenzy because you know that that that's definitely tied to the to the wear creature mythology. Um, the thing we're going to have to do, though, that's going to be interesting, if we want to get the Trollocs from book one, where they are trying to capture the Two Rivers gang and not kill them, is we need to design a catch pole, right? So I'm thinking this is a weapon that, uh, so it's long, right? It, it needs to be long so that they can get the, the kids at a distance. Um, so we're going to give it reach. So we're going to give it an extra five feet of reach for this thing. So you can grapple a creature with reach. And maybe we make it deal damage upon a successful grapple and any time somebody uh, attempts to escape, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, as I would, I had to, I had to review the Trolloc um, ecology in preparation for this. Um, one of the things is that Trollocs are rather weak on their own. Uh, like, like a standard fighter can, can go toe to toe with a single Trolloc and usually be fine. It's when they're in a pack that they're more dangerous. So we need some kind of ability to factor in how they're more dangerous in a group. So I was thinking something like it, maybe if you have a band of three or more of them together, you know, a really basic way to do that would be they get a bonus to their damage and their AC. Uh, maybe if they're in a group of three or more, they can give each other actions or something. So like this Trolloc that's at, that's at the far end spends two actions to give the Trolloc that's going toe to toe with Rand an extra action, something like that. Um, yeah, we, we'd have to come up with some kind of mechanic that boosts them in a group. We might go, for example, to the Hag's Coven ability to as, as a base for that, because when you get three or more Hags in a Coven together, they all immediately go up a level, they get access to extra spells, and they have this extra set of abilities that come in. So we could probably do like a Martial Coven for the Trollocs, something like that. Hmm. It's a really interesting uh, angle to take. I would not have uh, thought about using the hag rules with that, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense because, as you said in the books, uh, what is it? Uh, a single trollop goes down, you know, with a sideways glance, but uh, you know, you get uh, you get five or more in a group, and you've got a serious problem here. Yeah, another thing we might do if if we really want to kind of beef them up, we can give them. We can also incorporate their weakness to fear right? Because they are incredibly cowardly creatures. They really have to be driven hard by their Merdral to, to even, you know, 
to even stay organized. So we might make them weak to fear effects. You know, if they become frightened, you increase the frightened value by one, or it takes them two rounds to go down a frightened value or something like that. I see. I see. Yeah, that that's a really good mm -hmm. touch too. Uh, what is it? Uh, they really feel like if you've ever seen the like uh, animated uh, Lord of the Rings cartoon to where like they mm -hmm. they have that uh, that song that the orcs sing. Yes. <laughs> oh, what is that? Oh, I had that in my head just a month ago. Uh, where there's a whip, there's a way. Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems like a Trolloc uh, song there. Like, yeah, I mean, you can even <laughs> specifically make them weak to whips or when they take damage from a whip, they become frightened or something like that. Because that's one of the fun things you can do is you can add in these specific triggers that the players don't necessarily know about. And so you, when the player asks information about them or, or, or rolls a successful recall knowledge on them, they get this really cool flavorful piece of information and they can't wait to tell all of the other players about it, you know? Oh, yeah. What is it? Uh, it's uh, it's also a good way to incorporate some of the uh, knowledge skills and such into uh, what is it? Uh, some of the actual gameplay because a lot yeah. of the no <clears throat> depending on how you play, like a lot of the knowledge skills can kind of be less useful. And I mean, yeah. since it's a fundamental way that you're building the character, I like to bring stuff in that you know up to the forefront because I mean, if you put if you put ranks in uh, something like, you know, knowledge and uh, what is it, uh, dungeoneering or something like that, mm -hmm. and like your 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 GM never like calls for those roles, it's just yeah. like, well, why did why did I waste these points? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also interesting because like like your knowledge skills can overlap, where it's like like let's say you're trying to recall knowledge on a Trolloc. Well, a Trolloc is going to have a humanoid trait, so I can roll society to learn about it culture you know the tribes how they behave but if i want to know are they are they poisonous or do they carry any 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 disease that i need to be worried about you know that's going to be a nature check you know because that's going to come from their animal side um you know they are this unholy abomination so maybe i roll some kind of magical recall knowledge to understand you know what their weaknesses are and so one of the fun things you can do as a gm is you know, everybody at the table is going to have some different knowledge skill that they are invested in. And so you can just say, okay, for this person, I'm going to give this information. And for this person, I'm going to give this information. So the players are collaborating even when they are just remembering things about this creature. Oh, yeah. And uh, what is it? Uh, especially if uh, your players are more of the planning type, basically after you run into mm -hmm. like something like this the first time and you're like, you know, Oh, oh, holy cheese, guys, we just, we barely survived that one. We really need to come up with a plan for how to yeah. deal with these guys in the future. The thing I want to get better at as a GM is signaling ahead of time what kind of creature that they're going to be seeing next, where it's like, oh, you see these tracks, and you know that they look like wolf tracks, but it's weird. It's almost like the wolf is on its hind legs, hmm. you know? And then, oh, you hear these rumors in town about this uh, this creature with a bird face or something like that, you know, and it's like they they can start to triangulate what that what that is. Um, another fun thing to do if you have veteran players who have read the, the the monster books way too much, you know, they start to say, oh yeah, it's this thing. I know its weaknesses, etc. You can always just reskin it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can say, oh, um, like let's let's say you have them running into a hydra. And they fought hydras too many times. They know about its heads growing back. Well, maybe it's not a a big dragon snake like thing with with twenty heads. Maybe it's a uh, maybe it's a giant spider with twenty legs. And the only way to kill it is to cut off the legs. But the legs might grow back. You know, you're just you know you're just replacing one set of description for another. The numbers are all still the same, so you're not having to rebalance everything. Uh, and suddenly, your veteran players don't know what's going on anymore. Oh yeah, um, it's handy to uh, not have to reinvent the wheel for a lot of these things. Yes. Going into uh, where the conversation is heading anyway, um, if you've noticed, I've I've given you prompts basically from the Wheel of Time. So yeah. imagine you know that. <laughs> <laughs> why ever would I have a, a bias towards that intellectual property, huh? But. Uh, <laughs> um, how how would you take a uh, 
a more established uh, property, especially with the lore that uh, Pathfinder comes with, and try to make that more of a Wheel of Time feel, basically for you know people at home who are doing their own home games. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously there are IP issues that I'm not necessarily advocating that you, you know, publish material for, but in-house, uh, in-house stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so without without completely reinventing uh, the Pathfinder system, mm -hmm. um, how would you start to make the uh, the world feel a bit more like the Wheel of Time? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing I would do, as far as combat goes, there's an alternate rule set. Uh, in the game mastery guide called proficiency without level. So basically in, in Pathfinder 2e, as long as you are in, as long as you are trained or better in something, be it attack rolls, skill check, saving throw, whatever, all those numbers go up by one every level because you just you add your level to everything. Um, your monsters are also adding their level to everything. And so it's it's like, your abilities and their difficulties are kind of scaling like this, but that's what makes this level monster harder and this level monster easier. Um, uh, that works out well for, uh, you know, for kind of sending the message home that, oh, you as a first level player do not want to go after the frog hemoth, but you as a 10th level PC do not need to worry about the, uh, the, the zero level goblin tribe that is around the corner, right? You, you can make quick work with them without even having to have a combat. Um, what proficiency with that level does is it kind of takes that spread and squishes it all together. And they even, in that section of the GMG give the example of, let's suppose you're in a rule where it doesn't make sense for even the, the greatest swordsman in the world to be able to, to, to go to, to stand against six opponents all going against him at the same time, which is literally a line from, I think, Lord of Chaos. Um, and so they, they had that kind of world in mind when they were doing this system. So that's the first thing I would do because that makes it a little bit grittier. You know, it's like, there, there's a little bit more danger around every corner if even six novices can come gang up on you uh, when you're higher level. Um, so that's the first thing I would do. I think that would, I think that would bring in the the more realism that the, that the wheel of time is built on. The other thing we have to think about is what to do with the magic system, and this is true for most yeah. D20 system because I don't know that channeling and casting spells from spell slots is quite the same thing. No. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've heard it said that Aya Sedai are really more like um, kineticists in the sense that they just get to blast things off, but they're getting tired while they do it. And so there's a much more frequent discharge recharge cycle. So the way I might do that in Pathfinder 2e, I might expand the focus point system because the focus points, focus spells are kind of a, a compromise between you have so many spells per day and once you're done, you're done and the cantrips that you can just spam all day. It's, it's really, you have a, some number of focus points. It caps out at three and each focus bell costs you one focus point. And so if you're at the top of your game, you can do three of these really cool, unique class specific usually spells. And then you have to rest for 10 minutes. Hmm. And after you rest and refocus for 10 minutes, you come back and you've got your, your focus spells back. So what I might do to kind of compromise on that because the mechanics of the spells are great. You know, we've even got, a, you could probably come up with a mapping of, you know, what, which of the five powers is involved in each spell. Um, what I might do with that, though, would be just expand the focus point rules. Make every spell cost one focus point, maybe two if it's your maximum level, and give folks more focus points. Like, say, you can, you can reach a cap of six or seven instead of three. Um, I, I think that would give the, the better dynamic of, you know, of, of the Ayas Sedai or, or the Ashaman. Um, I'm going to expend all my energy now. Okay, now I'm going to get my energy back and I'm going to expend it again in some, you know, grand display. <clears throat> well, and uh, let me ask you this, kind of yeah. relating to it. Um, what is it? Uh, would you necessarily think it would be prudent to uh, make specific uh, features for like uh, a red Aja versus mm. uh, a green Aja? That is a great question. Yeah. Well, what is I it? I wonder, to... you know, I wonder if that's a good way to do the free archetype rule would be, uh, okay, so you want to do, you want to do, uh, you want to be Aya Sedai. Um, hmm. And let, let's say you're doing that through, maybe you're doing it through Sorcerer. Maybe you're doing it through, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine mapping a prepared spellcasting class 
to Aya Sedai because, you know, Aya Sedai are just, oh, I know how to do this so I can do it anytime, you know. Um, well, even, even though yeah. basically they all have the same capabilities, there are definitely focuses that certain Aya yeah. Sedai have over other ones. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, now that I think about it, I, I think probably that would be a great archetype track to have because you can pick your your class based on the type of spells you want to cast, yeah. right? Or the type of extra things you want to have. But then your archetype represents that secret knowledge that your Asha gives you, right? right. So there's, there's the tricks that only the blues know or the greens get, you know, maybe some extra weapon proficiency or something, um, you know, that, that you could flavor that on and, 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 but you don't have to make a version of that for every possible spell casting class that you choose. Yeah. I, I think that you could do a lot with that, and especially if you, uh, what is it, uh, if you included uh, even like, you know, Black Aja in there basically yeah. for, you know, potential... Uh, <laughs> Scheming? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that seems like a, a great political coming. character, like a political caster. I yeah, do that would those. be cool. I'm trying to remember, I don't think in the main story the Ashaman ever developed something akin to Aja's, but you would probably want to create something flavorful for them as well to, right. you know, may, maybe you set your adventure in the fourth age and yeah, they've been around long enough to, to develop that stuff. On the other side of it, the other thing we'd want to do for the Blade Masters, we would want more, we would want to incorporate all those great stances that the books describe, right? And there there is a stance mechanic in in Pathfinder 2E, it mostly goes to the monks. So we'd want to port that over again, maybe as like a, maybe an archetype track or something that anybody, that any, any combat focused class could I, bring in. I would, I would make an argument though, uh, in the Wheel of Time specifically though, any, uh, any blade master is basically like a monk that studies yeah. swordsmanship. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So maybe you make a maybe you 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 give some monk options that are specifically sword focused. There is there is some monastic weapon stuff. I'm not the expert on on monks that I should be, but uh, I don't I don't know that you, I don't remember whether you focus on a specific weapon like that. That would be cool to do though. Yeah, that that would be cool. What is it? Uh, you're getting me excited about the potential there. <laughs> but uh, what is it? Just to just to rein this back a little bit. Um, as far as this goes, obviously you want to uh, use the rules that are there to make it mm -hmm. a little bit easier on yourself because you know the the more stuff you can use that's already there, the more balanced it'll be. The more, uh, what is it? Uh, the well, the less work you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, can you uh, can you think of anything that is more or less a uh, a pitfall to this sort of thinking um, with a lot of the rule sets? Uh, you had mentioned before that uh, maybe uh straight level basically uh two attack bonuses might not necessarily be the best for a property like that because it's more realistic and you don't want you know one guy to be able to like blow through six swordsmen no matter what level uh what other things do you see as a potential problem yeah so th thinking about this from the perspective of at the table right because that's where this really comes to a head is player wants to do something cool gm either doesn't see where it is in the rules or sees a rule that kind of goes against what the player wants to do the thing i would always try to address would be are the rules themselves the trouble or are the rules just highlighting a difference in expectation either between players or between the gm and the player because you can absolutely adjust the rules, right? I mean, they're, they're modularized so that you can say, okay, we're not playing with this thing or we're going to play with this thing, but we're going to tweak it. But even if you make that adjustment, if you don't address that difference in expectation, you're just going to run into that conflict later. And so I, I, I understand some folks, you know, will, will run into an issue in the rules that they, that they do believe needs to be adjusted. But I sometimes think that's a proxy for difference in expectations. Um, as far as specifically going to Wheel of Time setting, the, the only other the only other pitfall I really see, and I and I'm not putting down the Wheel of Time as an IP, and I'm not putting down the uh, amazingly rich Wheel of Time RPG that came out uh, a couple decades ago now, I think. Sure. But <clears throat> the world of the Wheel of Time really does not have a very rich ecology of creatures. So like if I go to make a bestiary of Wheel of Time creatures, I'm going to have, what, a dozen varieties of Trolloc. 
I'm going to have um, the seemingly unending list of Shanshan creatures, but they're only going to be around when the Shanshan are around. Uh, and then I'm going to have a host of weird things coming out of the blight, but again, they're only going to be in the blight. So for most of the world that you're looking at, uh, you're mostly going to have Trollocs, Fades, and Humanoids, right? Like I, 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 like you would have to, you would have to bake in some additional lore uh, to get you a greater variety of creatures, right? Like, oh, Agonor's vault has been opened, and all of his prototypes of creatures from the Age of Legends are on the loose. You know, and that that could be your excuse for getting all this stuff, <clears throat> but it's not going to feel like the Wheel of Time story that we read, right? The Wheel of Time story that we read is primarily about people, right? I mean, there's even the huge chunk of books where the Trollocs go away, and it's literally just about getting all these people together. And so maybe that means that to really give it a Wheel of Time feel, you incorporate more social encounters. You know, you incorporate more intrigue rather than, okay. It's a great game. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> right? I mean, may, maybe you take some of these, some you know, some of these uh, social encounter rules and you beef those up to get your to get your game of houses going on. I'm into it. Uh, what is it? Uh, I have a special place uh, for any kind of investigative mm -hmm. or uh, oh, yeah. social uh, game. Those are always uh, those are always fun because as a player, I usually I usually appreciate the puzzle solving aspect yeah. of it. So, like, if you give me like you know, oh this uh, this stone door like uh, a rune lights up when you like come close to it, I'm like okay. Let's hunker down. What what is this doing? <laughs> so I'll, I'll, what does I'll the room you, look like? <laughs> so, I'll, so I'll pose you a question. When you say you like the puzzle solving, who's doing the puzzle solving? Are you the player solving the puzzle or is your character solving the puzzle? Well, um, in that context, it usually depends on the system. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a lot that basically, um, what is it? Uh, there are some that basically mechanically are resolved themselves. Uh, for instance, uh, do, 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 ICRPG, um, like it's literally an intelligence check. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, what is it? Uh, you apply basic effort, which is basically uh, the, you roll a D4 and it has like a hit point value basically. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, you know, your character is sitting there trying to figure out the riddle of the store while something else is happening that is basically going to be very bad if you don't solve it within a time point. <clears throat> At the other end of that spectrum, like, uh, especially for like the first edition, like D and D stuff, like they expected, like your, your DM would hand you like, you know, a cipher and it'd yeah. be like, okay, solve this. Like yeah. those are the two extremes. <laughs> And most systems fall somewhere in between there. For uh, for a Pathfinder game, I think it's I think you the system can support both depending on what the players yeah. tend to enjoy. And for me at least, um, I enjoy the ones to where you know the the DM's just like okay, the there's a glowing rune on the door whenever you walk by it, and I'm like okay. Well, what's the room look like? What what else is happening when I stand yeah. near the door? Is there, you know, uh, what what's the temperature in the room? Do is there an acrid <laughs> smell? You know, is, is there, there a charred is there a charred skeleton reaching out as though he were like <laughs> going towards a doorknob? <laughs> yeah, I I think a great um, compromise on that is things like your your the characters are getting the information. You know, like oh, you remember this guy did this thing in his life and oh you know that this culture values this thing or you know that uh the bridges in this city are all red or something like that but you have to let the players be the one to put those pieces together to actually solve it so it's like the information's coming out of the world so it's not it's not like you're stopping the game to give them the riddle of the sphinx or something yeah. you know but you're you're giving them pieces from the game that then they the players you know have to put together oh yeah what is it uh what is it? Uh, one of uh, one of my favorite uh, variations of this is basically the kind of the murder mystery. Yeah. Like you know you you walk into a room you find the archdeacon is dead, and uh, what is it? Uh, you find uh, bloody footprints and uh, leading to the window, 
and you go out to the window and uh, the footprints trail off till halfway uh, down the ledge and then there's just nothing there, you know, uh, huh, how did this happen? How, how did they gain entrance? There's no sign of forced entry, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, a Trail of Clues basically has a special place in my heart simply because yeah. it it gets the players into the mindset of the characters like the fastest in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I feel like a mystery is something it doesn't have to be the focus of an adventure, but you can put in a you can put a mystery in nearly any adventure. Oh, and yeah. it's an excellent addition. And uh what is it uh, relating this back to kind of the plot structure of the Wheel of Time like one of the things in uh the Eye of the World that keeps you going is constant sense of mystery because yeah. you have the vaguest sense of idea of why these boys are being changed yeah i feel like that's like a great adventure hook to start off a campaign mm -hmm. to where like it's you know well these monsters are chasing you and uh you don't know why <laughs> the, the thing i love more than anything and my goal every rpg session i want my players between sessions to be theorizing about what the heck is going on mm. right so i i want them i want to see them messaging each other i want to see them calling me and saying i think so and so is the bad guy or i think that item we picked up is cursed and i just i just listen to them like mm-hmm mm-hmm mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course you know any any good gm will listen to those they'll listen to those five theories pick the craziest one and suddenly that one is true right <laughs> was Claudia von Hammerstein the yeah. whole time. <laughs> it certainly was now. But just, it, it reminds me of the days back when we had to wait for Wheel of Time books to come out. And I would be on dragonmount.com on the forums and people would be sharing all these crazy theories, but they had this evidence and it all tied together. Oh yeah. And every once in a while, one of them would turn out to be right. <laughs> Honestly, uh, even if it... <sighs> How can I phrase it? I enjoy good literature, obviously, but uh, even if you do that with uh, subpar, it uh, it has an extra element to that. I, yeah. I do love the interaction with that. Um, yeah. Not to name names, but uh, there's a series that I've been following for a while that I'm ashamed to admit publicly. It's so bad, but uh, the thing that's kept me interested in it is like, okay, get out my conspiracy board and like, you know, with the red yarn, it's like, okay, this guy, he said this in book three, but like, you know, that doesn't seem to match what he said in book two. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Obviously one came, you know, this one came after that one. So that's not a continuity error. So like, you know, what, what was he lying then or is he lying now? Oh, oh God. Oh God. <laughs> One thing that I wanted to do uh, with you today, and we'll uh, finish off with this, uh, a little uh, brainstorming session because uh, the gaming track actually is uh, doing a module writing contest right now. Ooh. I thought we could, uh, what is it, uh, at least at a high level, not necessarily asking you for numbers, but mm -hmm. um, let's uh, let's brainstorm a uh, a module adventure idea. Uh, our theme this year is uh, piety and and or zealotry, depending on your point of view, uh, with the children of light. Ooh, okay. You are going to want to include this for uh, three to six players. So, you know, maybe mass combat shouldn't be your first option. No, no. <laughs> um, and uh, what is it? Uh, we need at least one combat encounter and at least one uh, social encounter, puzzle, or mystery. So okay, so a combat, a social, and a mystery. All right, yep. this is cool. Um, a few questions: Do we have any constraints on setting? Specifically, is this pre-last battle or post-last battle? Oh, you can uh, you can set it in uh, Faerun if you want. It isn't oh, okay. necessarily a setting specific idea, but- uh, Oh, okay, so it's just children, of, it's, it's exploring the theme of the children of light. Yeah, basically, basically pietry or zealotry has I to see. be the okay. initial cause. Okay, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, cause I, cause I was thinking about this prompt last night. I was like, all right, I don't wanna write out my answer to this, but I do wanna think about like, you know, you know, cause uh, I, we're, we're doing kind of lower level uh, PCs, is that right? Uh, okay. Up to you. Up to me, okay. so. I was thinking, about, okay, so we need it. We need a, because you always want to have what is actually going on. Mm -hmm. And then you want to have what the P 
PCs initially think is going on. Sure. Right, right. Because because you want to have some kind of progression there. You, you, know, you don't want them to show up to town and say, oh, there's a big bad guy in the tower right there. Can you please go deal with them? Right. You, know, you want there to be, well, the big bad guy is doing some sort of experiment and that experiment is causing a problem here and that causes a problem here and that eventually trickles down to the village right and then you have to you know you're you're basically designing the adventure backwards there i was thinking for for a lower for a lower level group so let's say maybe levels one through five something like that Mm -hmm. um i was thinking what if we had as like the final boss an animal that has become awakened Mm. right so they they suddenly become they wake up in the morning they become intelligent uh they're capable of speech they become sentient you know whatever terms you want to use there and they want and they want to learn what it means to be an intelligent being and so the the problem that's being created is that they are going into the nearby village and stealing just basically random stuff to try to understand what does it mean to be human, basically. So we'll do we'll we'll bring in a little bit of a a little bit of a Star Trek uh, theme there too, I guess. Um, but the but the townsfolk don't know that it's this creature stealing. They think that they're being stolen from by each other. And so when the players when the PCs arrive in this village, the village is at each other's throats because somebody is stealing something and they don't know who. So to blend that with the piety and zealotry what if we make it that more specifically this awakened animal is trying to figure out what deity awoke them mm-hmm. and so they are stealing artifacts and holy texts and vestments and things from every temple in town and every temple is pointing the finger at a different faith and there's about to be this multi-sided uh uh uh, uh religious war within this town maybe we have to make it a a larger town or small city to to encompass all that but like there's this there's this inter-temple war that's about to start and people are either having to choose sides or they're just boarding themselves up in their home because the clerics are about to go to war with each other Hmm. Hmm. what is it i like how that's going and that leads to our uh combat encounter and and that satisfies our uh mystery basically What is it? Uh, so let's say for simplicity's sake, uh, two sides. Uh, we'll sure, yeah, yeah. We'll work on the details of that later. But basically, we got two sides. Uh, basically, the initial uh, inciting incident is the first one gets stolen from, and they see mm-hmm. a, a group of adventures. Maybe even some of them might be involved in that religion. Yeah, yeah. What is it? Uh, so they go to investigate. Uh, that's our first uh, mystery encounter. Mm-hmm. We'll have like a couple of uh, interactions with uh, PCs that we can get some, uh, what is it, good role play in. We'll have like a scene to where they can go over some clues and basically come up with a theory. And in keeping with your idea of subverting the expectation, uh, what is it? Uh, we are going to have like a lot of the clues that basically lead them to believe that it is uh, this other faction. Uh, yeah. And I think what we do to, to maybe bait them a little bit, one of the leaders in that in that other faction, maybe not the maybe not the high priest, maybe just somebody that they're more likely to interact with, is a reformed burglar, hmm. or or has ties to the underworld or something like that. I like it. Uh, mm-hmm. An obvious clue like that will be eaten up by players, so they're going to most likely, what is it, uh, look at that and say, oh, obviously it's this guy. He's, you know. Unless you're my players, and then you say, well, that's too obvious, so it must be something else. <laughs> well, I mean. But they can it? go either way on that, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the catch-22 of all role-playing games. You can plan yeah. this out as perfectly as you want, but the players are never <laughs> choose yeah. the no, way you're thinking. No plan survives first contact with the players. Exactly. Um, that, and, I, and I think the way we track this, as this sort of goes back and forth, I would put in some sort of escalation point system where every time, some, where every time the players do something that exacerbates the rift between the two factions, like life in the city gets harder Mm. right so maybe prices go up a little bit uh it's harder to find uncommon items 
um, you know, DCs for diplomacy checks go up. Um, but if they can, if they can soothe matters, right? If they can, if they can get like a temporary truce or something, escalation points go down. They start to be they start to be more well thought of throughout the city, and so then they can maybe unlock specific boons and maybe even make a little bit of that necessary to get a specific clue. Well, and uh, I really like the idea of tying, um, what is it, uh, some sort of like random encounter to basically yeah. the temperature of the city. Yeah. Basically, so like if it's if you're at a point of like high chaos where tensions are flaring, like you're, uh, what is it, uh, you're likely to run into like, you know, 2d6 like guards like you know that'll yeah. uh hassle you but like if if it's at like a low point in the area you may just run across like a pickpocket or you know something minor maybe even something useful maybe uh maybe you run into the awakened animal itself it just doesn't talk to you 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 see this yeah. you know you you see a monkey that's just kind of like staring at you and they're using a fork to eat or something like yeah, that. And yeah, it's just yeah. like one of those, huh, that's strange. <laughs> so then we need some excuse for them to start getting out into the wilderness outside the city. Cause we need at some point to draw, to draw their attention to this. There might be something else going on here besides these two factions warring against each other um so may, maybe somebody runs away and they happen to run near the den of this awakened animal or the or the or the the, the awakened animal's former den right so they don't run into it they run into like the place it was living or something um could always have them you know eventually find weird tracks and and follow them right that's always an easy clue to leave um what is it uh especially if the tracks have uh one of the lost holy uh items Basically, yeah. you know, yeah. like they they went through uh, with a uh, uh, a relic of a seltzer, mm -hmm. and basically they get a, a dog to track uh, the scent of the. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I wonder too, like, so this awakened animal, is it is it literally just become sentient and it, and it's it's like a it's like a humanoid soul now in an animal's body, or does it get some extra abilities? Like, could it start reaching out to the minds of the townsfolk with some kind of telepathy or something? See, what is it? Uh, I love having an, a mystic element to this. So a bunch of the priests having weird dreams. Yeah. That... What if, okay, okay. So what if, what if we start with the two factions, right? That accuse each other of stealing from each other. This awakened animal starts reaching out to the priests and they think that this is some new deity calling to them and so now you have another party from both of these factions come together and unite under the vision of the monkey or something yes what is it uh oh that's cool yes i i think that has legs if we uh develop it a little bit more that uh that's like that's that that's clearly like like if this thing had say four parts to it that's definitely like a part three event i think to like you know well, to, to to ramp up the drama yeah it in an ideal like uh, structure, you wouldn't want to make the big reveal until like you know the act three, as it were. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that uh, that would be like a good one in there, and mm. especially because we're using something that's not really common in the monster manual. Yeah, like a psychic monkey is not necessarily <laughs> <laughs> like it wouldn't be something that they would necessarily uh see and it's playing on a lot of expectations for like uh clerics are getting weird dreams you think that that's something spiritual when yeah you know it it's not really it's yeah. you know i mm -hmm. i would i would have a lot of fun writing like uh some of the visions just because like you know the, the a priest is having like a a vision of a monkey with a third eye uh yeah asking. yeah it's oh, like man. He's like gonna... asking it, what is what is it to be human? What is love? And just like oh all gosh, these like weird yes. surreal questions. <laughs> yeah, there, there starts to be graffiti around the city with the monkey's questions. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And then and, and so and I'm just imagining the conversations at the table where the players are like, is the monkey a metaphor for something? No, it's like the monkey in the forest over there. You find out later. No, I, I love it. And 
I, I don't know about your players, but my players, like, uh, what is it? They they usually overthink a problem to where, like, it's like, okay, so obviously it's not a literal monkey asking them. Yeah, questions. yeah. That yeah. would be ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, what, what takes the place of, like, a monkey's? Okay, so maybe it's like a fey creature because, you know, they, they kind of like, you know, they – they kind of look at like humans as, you know, just another kind of animal. So like they wouldn't necessarily be able to see like, you know, the difference between a human and a monkey. Maybe, maybe it's just like this higher fey being that, and they, they would, I know that they would eat up that <laughs> line yeah, of questioning yeah. and lead to. I, I wonder if you could even, I, I, whenever I write a, an adventure material, I like to leave enough room for the GM to kind of play around with some of the details. I wonder if you could even in the module, leave it unspecified what type of animal it is. So that like, you know, may, maybe, you know, so that if you're, if your players are more inclined to try to uh, diplomatize the, the awakened animal, maybe you make it something friendly like a monkey. If they're more inclined to grab your torch and pitchfork, you make it an awakened bear. You know, mm. obviously a bear is more dangerous than a monkey right or maybe depending on if they're going one way and you want to subvert their expectations you turn it to kind of the other extreme and they have to go diplomatize the awake or they they could diplomatize the awakened bear or they could go after it in combat like i think i think we want to leave that option we probably want to leave that option open at the end i think well yeah and uh you would have to do some um what is it some careful crafting of the stats because uh a a big dang boss battle uh, hmm. is should be an option, be, especially yeah, yeah. if you have like more uh, violent players who basically mm -hmm. want that uh, sense of relief at the end of the investigation. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, I'm thinking that like, um, what is it? Uh, you may even want to make like a little, uh, maybe a three room dungeon basically for its den. Um, yeah. it, it may exert some limited control over like others of its same species so yeah. like, it has a couple mini a couple minions but i mean even if it's just like um even if it's just like a monkey doing this or something like that basically the monkey's basically using tactics and things like that mm -hmm. it helps you get to the point of solving the mystery and it yeah. also you know lends an interesting ta uh tactical element to it to where it's like Hey, wait! Did that monkey just try wield a, you know, <laughs> scimitar? That is not normal monkey behavior. <laughs> or, uh, or, or why? Why is the monkey using the same? Uh, why? Why is the why? Why are all the monkeys of the forest using the same flanking structure that we used in this one historical battle yeah. that a book was stolen about? And it's like the monkey is back there reading this history book about all these great battles hmm. yeah and I wonder... uh, especially if they're stealing holy uh relics yeah. like the monkey can now cast uh cleric spells oh my gosh yes the monkey, the monkey <laughs> either the monkey either studies enough and gets cleric spells or gets enough wands together that he can basically fake his way through being a cleric so another another thing I was thinking of um since the, since we're going to cap this off at a at, at a lower level we could at the end and saw a hook if we wanted to which is how did the how did the animal become awakened to begin with and maybe it's like there's some sort of magical pollution in the area that that you know that mutated the monkey and and, and made him awaken and so it's like you you solve the mystery you 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 resolve the, the town's issue but now you have to figure out where the heck this magical radiation came from Oh, yes. what, I think, what I think with that, if, if, if we do something to establish the source of the awakening, maybe the maybe this animal tries to take more of its kind to the source to reawaken the, to awaken them, but it goes wrong. Oh yeah, and that becomes your maybe your mid level boss or one of the minions in the final dungeon is these half awakened, mutated, maybe stronger, maybe they get a little bit of of, of innate spells or something animals where you're like, okay, we're on the right track with the monkey, you know? Yeah. No, um, and I love a module that ends with a hook that can tie into like another adventure, like yeah. uh, especially if like this doesn't neatly resolve the issue, like maybe the monkey's awakened because it found a meteor, yeah, and just living around this meteor basically caused it to mutate. And mm -hmm. uh, and what, what is, is that going to do to the town eventually? 
Oh yeah, and I and mean, oh, by the way, even when you deal with a monkey, you still have this social rift, right? So you might go trying to find out where the meteor came from and if anybody else got awakened from the meteor, but now you're emotionally invested in this town. Yep. And you want to make sure that they heal, and so you kind of split your time between adventuring and negotiating a peace treaty. Well, and uh, what is it? Uh, like I said, I, I like modules that leave that kind of stuff open because you can go yeah. two completely different ways with it. Yeah. And it would lead to an advent an interesting adventure either way. So yeah. um, I'm really liking the ideas that we're having here. But uh, time is catching up with us. Uh, I suppose it is. Goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll cut this short by saying. Um, what is it? Uh, where is a place that we can get uh, some of your products, including your archetype book? Yeah, so I think the archetype book, it should be up by the time uh, Jordan Con happens. So by the time people are watching this, it should be available. Uh, but you can find me on Drive Through RPG. Just look for Lion's Brain Media. So Brian Lane becomes Lion's Brain. It works. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, if folks want to follow me personally, uh, they can find me on Twitter at W Brian Lane. Brian is with an I. Um, and if folks like me and would like to see my physics stuff, I also have a YouTube channel, Let's Code Physics. It occasionally has RPG related stuff, but it's mostly programming and physics. But if that's something people are interested in, they can also find me there. All right. Uh, sounds good, man. Uh, All right. Thank you for coming uh i've enjoyed this conversation immensely so uh what is it uh, yeah <laughs> hopefully we'll do it again soon <laughs> definitely <laughs> all right and with that sir uh have a good day thanks you too